Hello students, this is Professor Gore, and uh, this is part four of the American Expansion Recorded Lecture. And so what we're gonna be covering in this part um, is the presidencies of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson's foreign policies up till World War I for Woodrow Wilson. We'll cover World War I in a separate recorded lecture. So um, really, we don't know how things would have, would have played out in world history, but certainly they would have played out differently in American history. Uh, had a um, anarchist named Leon Chogosh actually uh, shot and killed President William McKinley. Uh, McKinley had just beaten William Jennings Bryan in the election of 1900. Um, as I covered previously, Bryan in 1896 ran on, on the big ticket of silver, and uh, McKinley kind of ran on the gold standard, and uh, McKinley beat Bryan. And then in 1900, if Bryan had focused on the anti-imperialist argument, he could have won. I'm not saying he would have won, but he could have won. Um, certainly would have had a better chance instead of making silver the issue again in 1900 and McKinley wins. One six months into his time in office uh, for his second term that um, a loser anarchist uh, shot him uh, at the uh, World Trade Fair at Buffalo. And um, um, it, it's really tragic, but it forever changed the course of American history. I used to have my high school AP U.S. history students read a book called um, 10 Days that Unexpectedly Changed America. And that was one of the 10 days because it made Teddy Roosevelt uh, president of the United States in 1901. Uh, and it forever changed the course of American history. He expanded the power of the presidency more than any other president before him. He also got us more involved in foreign affairs than any other American president before him. Um, also became the first progressive era president and, and took the side of labor. Also became the, really the first true uh, conservationist president so much we're going to talk about uh, Teddy Roosevelt that he was the first. And if you look at his, his biography of his life and of his, and his accomplishments, no other president has accomplished uh, as much he, as he has outside the White House uh, in American history. So I know I'm biased. He's my favorite president for, for many reasons. He's certainly not perfect and certainly makes mistakes during his presidency. But um, him coming into office in, in 1901 was really kind of a fluke. Uh, the only reason why the Republicans had him as VP in 19, election 1900 was because they were trying to get rid of him as, as a reforming governor of New York. And uh, the people, the Republicans in New York were sick of him. He was uh, trying to clean up some of the, the political corruption there. So they put him as vice president because it was considered the most insignificant office in the country. And uh, Leon Cholgosh, um, who shot President McKinley at point, uh, close range, McKinley should not have died, really. Um, if he would have been around modern medicine, he certainly would have lived. The problem is, is when the surgeons went in to try to operate and remove the bullet, they didn't do it with proper lighting at uh, the room they offered operate him on in Buffalo. And they dug around too long. And um, anyway, he infection set in and he ended up dying. Um, but really, it's a tragedy. Of all the American presidents assassinated, um, each one, like... The guy, Charles Guiteau, who killed Garfield was just a lunatic. Uh, you know, John Wilkes Booth was just an angry uh, Confederate sympathizer. Uh, and then you had Lee Harvey Oswald was um, an angered communist at uh, Kennedy. But uh, Leon Chokos killed McKinley for no other reason. He's wanted to make a name for himself. So it's, it's pathetic. So anyway, but let's get to uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his uh, presidency. So here is the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, arguably one of probably the, the greatest energy of any president in American history. I mean, the guy could just uh, enormous energy. I so everybody who ever met him, any primary sources talk about, golly, how's this guy have so much energy? And he ate a lot. Um, and so he fueled himself well uh, and so forth. So we're going to cover his uh, foreign uh, policy is called Big Stick Diplomacy. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute. Certainly has the coolest name. Um, Taft's is dollar diplomacy and Wilson's is moral diplomacy. And so um, one thing that's interesting is um, Teddy Roosevelt was one of the guys that actually was influenced by social Darwinism. Um, and so he did he did sympathize with minorities across the globe more so than than a lot of the European imperialists. Um, but he still was in favor of imp imperialism to a certain extent. He's a little more sympathetic to European imperialists. Now, did he think that they should have gone as far as they did? No, uh, and so forth. Um, but 
with with Roosevelt, you got to understand whenever there is yin, there is yang. Um, he he his personality kind of made him seem a lot more radical than what he was. He actually was fairly moderate uh, for his day and age, and so he could always kind of counter himself well. And so uh, one of the things though is he really worried about um, a, a world war and predicted that, that European powers would fight one. And he really did try to keep world peace. And so that's why he kind of was a counterbalance to some of the Europeans. Um, but he felt like it was Americans' moral duty, okay, to maintain his balance of power. You got to understand anything about Teddy Roosevelt, you understand that he viewed things as right and wrong. If he ever saw something as morally wrong, then he would campaign mightily um, against that until that, that moral wrong was righted. Um, and so... You, you, he was a very moral man in that sense. Um, and so when he saw somebody, um, what he thought was getting bullied or some immoral action taking place, um, he did take a stand. Um, he also was one of the first American presidents to take a stand on race. Now, compared to later times, uh, not that much, but um, for that day and age, like inviting Booker T. Washington to have dinner at the White House was the leading African-American leader. No other president had done that. Uh, he did it several times. Um, now, Lincoln had met with Frederick Douglass um, amongst a group of individuals, but uh, Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington over for dinner several times, um, and so at least, well, at least twice. And um, when at one point he met the governor of Arkansas and made a racist comment, he corrected him right there on the spot. And so you got to understand he's a, he's a complex individual in American history. So let's talk about um, – this Anglo-American friendship that was taking place. As Britain was threatened by rivals, particularly Germany, France, and Russia, it sought U.S. favor after the Spanish-American War. In the hay Ponsfoot Agreement of 1901, Britain gave up its treaty rights to participate in any Central American canal project, clearing the uh, way for a canal uh, under exclusive U.S. control. Now, one of the two things that Teddy Roosevelt's probably his greatest achievements as president and what he's most known for um, is the Panama Canal, one of the most important infrastructure improvements, uh, really projects of world history. Uh, and then also um, his conservation with environmental, which we'll cover in the Progressive Era lecture. And so um, Britain basically gave the U.S. the rights if they want to build a canal, they could. And so Teddy Roosevelt actually does that. Uh, and one of the things, too, um, two years after uh, Britain handed that over, the last of the vexing U.S.-Canadian border disputes, this one involving British Columbia and Alaska, was settled, again, to American satisfaction. Neither country entered into an alliance, but both viewed the other as a friend, which would come in handy during World War I, because Britain is going to definitely suck up to the U.S. during World War I. Um, so let's look at the, the big stick policy. The reason why it gets called that is when he was delivering a public speech, um, he said his favorite African proverb was, um, speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. So what he was saying is, is that you, you basically ask nicely, okay, but then you bring the mighty U.S. Navy behind you to influence their decision. Um, and so he wanted to increase battleships for the U.S. Navy. In fact, one of the main reasons why the United States is really prepared for World War I with the Navy, not with the Army, is because of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, in 1904, the U.S. Navy stood fifth in the world. By 1907, it was third. And by the time um, World War I started, the U.S. was number two, only behind Great Britain. Um, now, let's look at his uh, foreign policy when it comes to Latin America. Now, if you remember, the Monroe Doctrine was, for those who have in U.S. History, one was, was written in 1820s by John Quincy Adams, then Secretary of State, and delivered by then President James Monroe. And basically, it told European countries, hey, stay out of Western Hemisphere affairs, Okay, like North America and South America. We'll stay out of European affairs. It was really aimed at Russia, who was creating fishing settlements along the Pacific Northwest. Um, we don't use it until we have some, a border dispute with Venezuela and British Guiana. But really, the man, the myth, the legend who uses it is Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and so he adds, in addition to the Monroe Doctrine, it's called the Roosevelt Corollary. And this is what the newspapers called it. Um, and what that means is, is he said that we could take preventative action um, to prevent um, a European country from taking over a Latin American nation. So, for instance, um, Dominican Republic was almost taken over because they couldn't pay back their debts. I think he was at a Britain of Germany. And the United States sent accountants down there to help them gather the revenue necessary to pay back their debts so they didn't get taken over. That would be preventative action. Okay. 
Um, so I don't want, and it was a way to, pre, to prevent war. And it was a, it was a good, a good move uh, for the time. So this is a famous political cartoon of Teddy Roosevelt. He's acting like the world's policeman. And he's got this big stick he's carrying, and you've got uh, the Latin American nations. Uh, he's also um, dealt with uh, an issue in North Africa where uh, an American was captured over there, and he was able to negotiate his release. And then you've got Europeans over there on the other side of the globe who are trying to take over um, parts of Latin America and so forth. And here, Teddy Roosevelt is kind of like ask, acting as like an international policeman, and really. Um, of all American presidents up to this point, he was probably the most respected by uh, European powers. Um, in fact, uh, uh, even the Kaiser of Germany kind of kissed his rear end a few times, especially after he left the White House, um, trying to buddy up with him. Um, and so the first thing that, that really is known for is Panama, the country today, was actually controlled by Colombia. Now, um, Colombia was originally going to be willing to allow a uh, a country to build the canal because it was going to provide tremendous economic commerce for them. So the United States came in, they offered um, millions of dollars, um, basically about $40 million. And um, what ends up happening is they were going to pay this amount and then build a canal for them. So Columbia wouldn't get to be out anything. They're going to pocket money off of this, not to mention they get to bring all the revenue in from the ships going through well, the Colombian Congress felt like the United States was kind of being a bully in this situation for whatever reason, and they rejected. So Teddy Roosevelt heard about that the Panamanians wanted independence, so he encouraged it. And when Colombia sent troops in, the United States Navy came in and basically prevented um, Colombia from coming in and uh, putting down the Panamanian revolt. So Panama uh, gains independence and the United States recognizes uh, Panama as the independent country. Um, in 1922, though, the U.S. did pay Colombia about $25 million as a concession for the involvement with that. Um, but Panama is the one who came out smelling like a rose on this deal. So the Panama Canal cuts the journey from the Atlantic Ocean Pacific Ocean in half. It, 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 when I say it's one of the most important um, infrastructure projects in world history, it really is. I would argue maybe the Suez Canal is probably more important, but the Panama Canal is a close second. Uh, I only say that about Suez Canal because of the world's oil supply that goes through there. So, hey, Buena Varia Treaty. Um, basically, we paid Panama $10 million for the strip of land to build a canal and a $250,000 yearly rental fee. What a smoking deal for Panama. This is a political cartoon. is is. Uh, kind of anti-Roosevelt. Roosevelt's digging the Panama Canal, throwing dirt on Bogota, and the U.S. Navy is backing him up, which I thought was kind of a funny little cartoon. This is a funny one. Um, Roosevelt's riding a big battleship with carrying his big stick. And this one, pulling out the Panama Republic out of Colombia. Um, he was the first American president while president to leave and travel to a foreign country. Um, he had such energy, he actually got on cranes and started digging dirt. I don't know why he did it in a white suit, but he did. Um, he helped also encourage uh, to send some doctors down there to figure out a way to combat yellow fever. What they discovered is yellow fever was spreading by mosquitoes, and mosquitoes bred in puddles of water. So anytime it rained, they got rid of all the puddles of water and sprayed, um, and it actually cut down yellow fever significantly. The French tried to build one in Nicaragua, and because of yellow fever, it put an end to the project. Now, later, when Teddy Roosevelt left the White House, um, he was asked at a speech in California at Cowboy Airport about the Panama Canal. And he says, I'm interested in the Panama Canal because I started it. If I had followed traditional conservative methods, I would have presented a dignified state paper to Congress and the debates on, debates on it would have been going on yet. But I took the canals on and let Congress debate. And while the debate goes on, the canal does also. Basically, he gets crap done. All right. So... These islands uh, were all taken before his presidency um, and so forth. But if you look at all the years that the United States intervened militarily, now a lot of them happened during Woodrow Wilson's presidency, um, particularly during World War I or before World War I and so forth. But you can see the United States intervened in a couple different places uh, during Taft and Wilson's presidencies. Here's one of my favorites, Teddy Roosevelt walking through the Caribbean Sea, carrying the Navy with his big stick. 
All right. So highlight and underline and star the Roosevelt quarterly. Oftentimes you see that on a quiz or a test. So let's look at when the U.S. Pl uh, played the role of policemen of the Caribbean. Before the U.S. left Cuba in 1902, they helped re reorganize their finances and also clear swamps to stop the spread of malaria slash yellow fever. Cuba also accepted the Platt Amendment, which uh, gave the U.S. the right to intervene if Cuban independence was threatened or if internal, uh, internal disorder broke down or just internal order broke down. The U.S. received Guantanamo Bay for a large naval base, which we still hold today. Roosevelt soon enacted what uh, has been called the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine that gave the United States intervene in Western Hemisphere to prevent European involvement. So take more preventative action. So it's like, uh, you know, I, I rotate my tires as preventative action to keep my tires from wearing down as rapidly. Um, he also said the United States act as a policeman in the region. Basically, this gave in U the U.S. an unrestricted right to regulate Caribbean affairs. Uh, now, the Roosevelt Corollary was not treated with other states. It was a unilateral declaration sanctioned only by American power and national interest. In 1905, American personnel took over the customs and debt management of the Dominican Republic, and similarly, the finances of Nicaragua in 1911 and Haiti in 1916. Uh, the Nicaraguan was done by Taft and Haiti was done by Wilson. When domestic order broke down, the U.S. Marines occupied Cuba in 1906, Nicaragua in 1909, Haiti and the Dominican Republic in later years, and Americans often refer to the Caribbean and Central American countries as banana republics, implying that they could only sell bananas for profit. Ouch. Okay. Now, um, one of the things is that Roosevelt loved his Secretary of State, John Hay, um, who did retire during his uh, uh, Roosevelt's second term. And um, he had been appointed by McKinley and he was really a good, really good Secretary of State. Um, but he, he encouraged free trade in China because of the spheres of influence. Uh, where European powers and Russia and Japan and so forth were carving up China. They're not actually government-wise controlling it, but they're creating economic monopolies. We're making it where in South China, the Chinese people there can only trade with Germany. In Manchuria, they can only trade with Russia. Uh, on different parts of the coast, they can only trade with Japan. Another part, they can only trade with Britain. Uh, and the south uh, west part, they can only trade with France. That's, that's economic monopolies. Okay, So John Hay comes in and said, hey, why don't we establish free trade for everybody? So everybody's get a slice of the, Ch uh, the Chinese economic pie. Uh, and so anyway, the, uh, the Philippine rebellion eventually uh, ended in 1902. And Ted Roosevelt and John Hay were happy about that. Now, one of the things that happens in China, which was, which was terrible, and McKinley actually sent troops before Roosevelt came into office, but it's called the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and it was this, this secret, and they were actually ninjas, I can't make this up, the secret Chinese group, um, that practiced martial arts and because Europeans were ignorant to what martial arts actually was, they called them boxers because that was the only hand-to-hand -hand combat they're familiar with. But the fists of righteous harmony basically wanted to repel foreigners and they thought um, that they were going to be impenetrable to white bullets and so forth. And, and it broke out Northeastern China and they began slaughtering Europeans, Japanese, uh, you know, Americans, Russians, Germans, French, British, you name it including men, women, and children, particularly missionaries. Now, it was supposed to be a kill all order across the entire country, but uh, uh, a couple of Chinese government officials uh, failed to give the order to the rest of the nation. Thankfully, they did the right thing there. Um, so several countries sent in, including the United States, sent about 2,000 troops to put down the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion gets put down, and China's forced to pay back damages. Now, the Empress at the time, Empress Dowager, actually encouraged that. And thankfully, it didn't spread to the whole country. Otherwise, it wiped out everybody, European-wise uh, and American. So uh, the Chinese nationalist movement gets put down. Okay, You can see the spheres of influence here within China. A lot of China wasn't affected, but you can see which parts were. This is Uncle Sam calling for open door instead of just cutting it up. All right. So I've covered the Boxer Rebellion. We, we, I'm sorry, I said 2,000. We sent about 5,000. And uh, it does get put down pretty ruthlessly. As, as ruthless as the, the Boxer Rebellion was, they're, the, putting it down what probably wasn't as bad, but it was still pretty bad. I've seen some images that I can't show in, in the class, but it's pretty horrific. Um, now, in the 1890s, before this, uh, China was as weakest point in world history. 
they fight the Sino-Japanese War in 1894, 1895, and, and Japan just whoops them up. Um, but China's too proud to uh, really admit defeat, and but they're eventually forced to because Japan beats them so bad, and so they they pay Japan 333 million. Um, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, they, they didn't pay them that much. They um, uh, did, did have to pay the Japanese some, uh, some and then um, the Japanese seized some land, but then the Europeans forced the Japanese to give it some of it back. And that's going to put a sour taste in Japan's mouth. And remember that because in the 1940s, Japan's going to put a beat down on a lot of those European countries that did that to them, including France and Britain. And so um, because of the Boxer Rebellion, China has to pay a buttload of money. That's $333 million and so forth. Then in 1903, um, Russia and Japan went to war over this uh, peninsula area and part of Manchuria and Korea. Poor Korea gets beat up so bad um, at this time. It gets pushed around. Um, Russia was supposed to be this huge, huge military juggernaut. And Japan was supposed to be this little, you know, scrappy country. But that little scrappy country just gave the Russians a good old fashioned jab slap. And they, they crushed their Navy, beat their army. But Russia, the problem is, just had so many men they could send into the in the fray. And so neither country wanted to admit defeat. And uh, Japan at, um, had asked Teddy Roosevelt to uh, um, arbitrate a peace settlement, which he does. And they meet in Portsmouth, uh, New, uh, New Hampshire. And uh, what ends up happening is Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt later wins the Nobel Peace Prize. So he's the first American president to ever win the Nobel Peace Prize for helping negotiate this treaty. Yeah. He had been working on trying to bring those two countries together for quite some time. He helped kind of persuade Russia to swallow their pride. Um, Japan feels like they get the shore in the stick and they're kind of resentful of this situation. Russia is not fully satisfied, although Russia was, was too prideful in that um, scenario. But this is the famous picture of uh, Roosevelt and the Russian diplomats on the left and the Japanese diplomats on the Okay, so the Russo-Japanese War technically was a military victory for Japan, uh, but they don't get as much. They split the Sakhalin Island, which actually weren't the whole thing, but uh, they, they, they split the best part of it. The Portsmouth Treaty helped negotiate the end of the Russo-Japanese War. Way to go, TR. Now, in 1907, a particular issue happened, which was not a shining moment in American history. Um, an earthquake happened in San Francisco area, and the San Francisco school board um, had damaged school buildings. And what they did is they took the white children out and put them in different buildings, but left the Koreans, Chinese, and Japanese children in the damaged buildings. Now, there's, as a teacher myself, I, there there's so many things wrong with that morally um, to to put your put children in harm's way, regardless of race or ethnicity and so forth. Well. Japan finds out about it. They send a scathing letter to TR. When TR hears about it from Japan, he is livid at the situation. He calls the San Francisco School Board to DC. He chews them out to no end and says, demands that they put those children um, in a proper school or he will take care of himself. He does send a letter back to Japan. He's like, look, I understand your frustration. We will treat Japanese citizens better so long as you quit sending so many over here. So it's kind of like a no formal agreement met, but it's kind of like met on the gentleman's handshake. Look, we'll make sure the Japanese Americans are treated better. Okay. That is until his second cousin came into office and put him in internment camps in the 1940s. But um, for a while, they did treat him, uh, treat Japanese Americans better um, in exchange for quit sending so many over because of there was labor unrest in there. Then in 1908, um, Japan and the United States entered uh, the Root Takahara Agreement, basically like, I respect your territorial claims, you respect mine. Uh, Roosevelt, in his last year in office, sent um, what they called the Great White Fleet uh, around the globe. Now, it wasn't because of Caucasians or anything, but the bottom of the ships at that time were painted white. Now, we would never do that today because it makes it easy to spot on the ocean, but this is for show back then. And so he sent the Navy on a world tour to kind of flex American military muscle. And if one of the first places he sent them to was Japan, so that they back off. He predicted that the United States would fight a war with Japan, which was spot on uh, because Japan attacks the United States on December 7, 1941. Uh, what was funny is Congress wasn't going to allocate enough money to send them around the globe. So he sent them halfway and he's like, what are you going to leave them in China? And so it forced them to, to fund the money to bring them home. So pretty clever politician there. And uh, here's big stick diplomacy. 
His face is on the front of the great white fleet. And Prudential Life Insurance even used the great white fleet in an advertisement. Now let's look at um, um, Taft. His foreign policy is pretty easy to remember. He focused on dollars, okay? And so, um, and it's called dollar diplomacy. He used American investors to invest money into countries where the U.S. had a commercial interest. Uh, Taft was actually pretty brilliant, brilliant at this. The country's economy benefited as well as the U.S. economy. Taft hoped that the American capital would counterbalance Japanese power and pave the way for increased commercial opportunities. When the Chinese Revolution of 1911 toppled the ruling Manchu dynasty, Taft supported the victorious Chinese nationalists who wanted to modernize their country and liberate it from Japanese domination. Uh, the U.S. thus entered a long-term rivalry with Japan that would end in a war 30 years later. So Taft actually kind of helped contribute to that. Taft is a one-term president. Um, what's interesting about Taft is he actually did not want to be president. His wife wanted to be president. Um, Roosevelt kind of hand-selected him. Roosevelt, because Roosevelt was so popular, um, whoever Roosevelt endorsed was going to win the presidency. And Taft won it. Really what Taft wanted to be is Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, which he eventually be becomes. He was our most overweight president. Um, he did struggle with um, depression and, and eating and so forth. But the cool thing was that he has a success story. Later, after leaving the White House, um, which, by the way, he did get stuck in the White House bathtub and they had to make a special one that was wide enough for him. Um, once he became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he lost like 100 pounds and was healthy and happy um, and, and kind of got himself mentally healthy as well. So it was a happy ending there. Um, but he was just kind of a, a you know, easygoing guy that a lot of people liked and uh, so forth. So um, let's look at Woodrow Wilson. So I don't spend much time on Tab because basically he invests money into foreign markets. Bingo. All right. Now, Wilson is a little bit different. Uh, he became president in 1913 and he was bent on reform on American foreign policy, no less than in domestic policy. Wilson viewed himself as a great reformer. Wilson, like Taft and Roosevelt, saw the importance of overseas markets, but he opposed dollar diplomacy, when, um, which he believed bullied weaker countries financially and gave undue advantage to American business. The U.S. Wilson insisted should conduct its foreign policy in conformity with democratic principles. His foreign policy came to be known as moral diplomacy. He was committed to advancing human rights, national integrity, and opportunity abroad. Basically, the U.S. would do business with you if you were a good moral nation, hence moral diplomacy. Okay. Now, Mexico became the primary object of Wilson's administration. So let's look at the Mexican Revolution. So this is kind of a complicated mess. Um, there was a guy by the name of Madero, um, Francisco Madero, um, who ran for the presidency. His, I don't have his picture up here. I cover him a little more detail in world history. And then he ran against a, a ruthless dictator named Porfirio Diaz. Diaz rigged the election. So Madero would not win and then put him in prison. Um, there was a revolution that broke out. Diaz is forced to resign and Madero becomes president. But then um, the guy in the middle, General Victorano Huerta, one of the Mexican generals, stages a coup and has Madero killed. So that leads to more revolution. And Carranza becomes the leader of the new revolution. And then one of his commanders was a guy named Pancho Villa. Now, Pancho Villa, along with uh, Emilio Zapata, um, were kind of more figureheads in the rural population, where Carranza was more of the, in the urban population. Um, Huerta was not liked by Wilson. Uh, Carranza did not like Wilson meddling in uh, Mexico's affairs. And so eventually, um, Carranza it forces Huerta to rescind the presidency. And... Um, um, Carranza wanted was really, he didn't want American intervention. All he wanted was to buy American weapons, which Wilson allowed in 1914. Um, when it became clear that Huerta was not about to fall, the U.S. threw its own forces in the conflict. On the pretext of minor insult to the U.S. Navy at Tampico, Wilson ordered the occupation of the port of Veracruz on April 21st, 1914, at the cost of 19 American and 126 Mexican lives. Eventually, Huerta fell to Carranza in August of 1914. Then one of Carranza's generals, Pancho Villa, rebelled and was driven north. He went into Mexico one night and killed 16 uh, American civilians uh, taken from a train in January of 1916. Now, the reason why he killed 16 random Americans, innocent, was because he wanted to spark a war between the U.S. and Mexico. Um, he also raided the town of Columbus as well, 
Wilson ordered 11,000 troops under General John J. Pershing, who leads the expeditionary force into, into World War I, um, to capture him, but was unable to do so. Uh, Mexican public opinion demanded that Pershing withdraw and armed clashes with Mexican troops began. At the brink of war, the two governments backed off and the U.S. forces began to withdraw in early 1917. And by 1917, the U.S. recognized Carranza's government officially, and Wilson also purchased the Virgin Islands from Denmark. Now, I'm going to cover another complicated thing with the Mexican um, issue when we get to World War I. We talk about the uh, Zimmerman telegram. Um, but Mexico does not like the United States being involved there. Wilson almost provokes a war with them. Um, thankfully, he, cooler heads prevail and they pull out. Now, i got to tell you a fascinating story about Pancho Villa. Um, he rode, was the first guy to actually film live, live combat. Um, and he was known to ride um, Indian chief motorcycles. Now, they were a famous motorcycle company that went under during the Great Depression. They're back now. Somebody has brought back the company. But uh, American forces rode Harley Davidson's and, and weren't able to capture Pancho Villa. And so it kind of led to the myth of Indian chief motorcycles being the best motorcycles in American history or whatever. But Pancho Villa ends up getting it killed and assassinated by one of his lieutenants. All right. So Mexican revolution is going to cause some conflicts and we will cover more of that when we get to the World War One recorded lecture. And that's it.